Hey, everybody. Welcome to Popular Music Books in Process. Our series is a collaboration between IASPM US, the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the POP Conference. The POP Conference starts this week with a keynote featuring Ann Powers talking with, who is it, Carl Weatherstation, um, lead person, Blood Orange's lead person, Dev Hines, and a couple of other equal notables, although not in my brain at this moment, um, and then has stuff all day, Friday and Saturday. So look for the POP Conference schedule and register for that. Um, Carl, who I've just name checked, as well as Kimberly Mack, who may not be able to be with us today, are the co-organizers of this series and do all the lifting. Carl will be handling the Q&A after this. Um, this is a regular thing for us. We always uh, put past events in YouTube. So if you're new to the series and wanna check out prior um, popular music books series events, they're all there. Um, but for today, we have Phil Oslander, and he is joined in conversation by Stan Hawkins, but as we'll explain in a moment, will not be joined live on Zoom by Stan Hawkins. Um, we'll, we'll get to that. So um, <laughs> Phil is a professor of performance studies and popular musicology in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication of Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. Um, he has written a good number of books, um, alternating a little bit between University of Michigan Press and Routledge um, um, on postmodernism and cultural politics, on uh, modernism and postmodernism, on liveness, maybe in some ways the seed of this one, but we'll talk about that in a second, on performing glam rock, um, performance and documentation, and now um, pretty recently out, like January or so? Yes, yes, just after the first of the year. Um, University of Michigan Press, in concert performing musical persona, which he'll be talking about today. Um, um, the bio he gave us mentions um, places he's written for, and then the intriguing fact that he's also written, produced, and acted in a short film. So that is something to look for, Dr. Blues. Um, and Phil is gonna be talking with Stan Hawkins, the professor of musicology at the University of Oslo. That's your key for why he's not here with us live. Do the time zone math. Um, prof professor of popular music as well, um, whose books include Settling the Pop Score, The British Pop Dandy, Prince, The Making of a Pop Music Phenomenon, Queerness in Pop Music, so on and so forth. Um, the worry was that Stan was going to feel like crap if he did this live. So, um, so Stan and Phil had a conversation, which they recorded. And so we're going to start by listening to that conversation. You are completely encouraged to put comments and questions in the chat, even as that conversation goes on. Um, you may actually have the rare privilege of getting to chat with someone who's speaking at the same moment, which has never happened before in this series. So feel free to send provocative comments, Phil's way, during the thing so we can stretch the limits of liveness, which seems somewhat relevant. Um, Phil, do you want to set anything up before you share screen and start? Otherwise, welcome to the series. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, yeah, I don't need to set too much up. I mean, as Eric already said, uh, Stan and I had a conversation yesterday morning. Well, for me yesterday morning, for him in the afternoon, and uh, we recorded it and we'll start with that. And yeah, actually, I really, really love the idea of people putting comments into the chat along the way. I, I will watch <laughs> to see people what people are saying. Um, and if uh, uh, and maybe respond, just depending. And then at the end of that, I will, of course, remain here for a live uh, Q&A. All right, so let me go to the screen share here. And, uh, oh, I see, okay. There it is. And please make sure, if you can't hear it or see it or anything like that, please let me know. So, I'm really delighted uh, to be invited to the series and conversation with you, uh, Phil. And I realize that this event today is more about a book that has been in process and successfully a book that is still in the making. Um, certainly, In Concert has given you the opportunity and 
for that matter, the daunting task, I would say, to revisit many of your early ideas and uh, certainly bears the fruits of what has been for you an ongoing project, I know, that spans a lot more than just a decade. And as such, you consolidate a myriad ways of looking at music and concert, stressing the salient point that you are less interested in music as performance than as musicians as performers. And I think that's a really, really critical point and it gets flagged up in the first pages of the book. And that's something the reader has to hang on to, I feel. Um, your notion of the musical persona uh, enriched by a wealth of disciplinary interventions harnesses the idea of performance as embodied action. And the phenomena of musical personae in this book, an incredibly interesting and relevant aspect, builds, I felt, uh, creatively on your other writings, not least uh, performing glam rock from 2006, which uh, you know has had a major bearing on my own theory uh, on pop dandyism in British performers. It was a huge inspiration for me, this work, and actually gave me the motivation to go in directions I wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, in the feedback and discussions I've had with my students, uh, at both universities I teach at here in Norway, uh, one is Oslo University, the other is Agda. Um, during the short period the book has been out, uh, there is resounding admiration for your handling of a multitude of concepts that aid musical interpretation. Especially the theorization of genre has mm -hmm. come up in many of my conversations, which expands on the existing literature in our field of popular music studies and pushes forward the frontiers, with you placing the spotlight also on Gen Z, the generation we are actually now teaching at universities and colleges around the world. Can you believe it? Um, so I agree that this current generation is, in one sense, less interested in labels recognizing categories such as sexuality and gender as fluid, which you mention in your book. Yet you remind us, and this is one of the many, many quotations I've sort of hung on to, uh, to quote you, as human beings, we live and die by categories, unquote, which implies that any assumption that music cannot be categorized is untenable, as you say. In addressing categories of practices, you expertly demonstrate how genre frames establish expectations concerning what happens in performance, and this is backed up by a multitude of musical examples and case studies. So for me, every chapter in the book functions as a vibrant entity on its own, while also contributing to the stream of arguments from beginning to end. The book literally flows. Due to time constraints, and you know I would have loved to have spent a whole day on this, um, I want to single out uh, chapter three, Sound and Vision, as one of the many cases of a major breakthrough in the tackling of relationships between visual and auditory elements in musical performance. And I recognize this material emanates from also an Oxford handbook of new audiovisual aesthetics that we both contributed to. Um, and your critique on liveness, which obviously resonates with your work in your book, Liveness, Performance in a Mediatized Culture, is quite exemplary in bringing into focus a body of research that kind of wrestles with matters of perception, authenticity, ideology, and technology. And I was particularly struck by the analysis under the subsection liquid light, including reference to Jefferson Airplane, which is highly inspirational due to the way you delve into the sheer power of the visual track in terms of the audiovisual economy of musical performance through technological change. And this is a really, really important moment uh, for me in the book, which I'd like to come back to a bit later. Um, another major strength is the inclusion of examples drawn from popular music really in its widest definition. 
uh, jazz, blues, rock, pop, experimental, digital interfaces, dance, classical music, country, el electronic music, you name it. But without ever losing the reader, you chip away at the sheer complexity surrounding musical personae, superbly borne out by your detailed analyses of performances. And together with uh, many of my postgraduates, I feel that this uh, book is a kind of climactic point in your own oeuvre of work. And it is actually this achievement that secures and continues to secure your standing as a world-class music scholar. And to those of us joining us today in this uh, chat, I recommend this book unreservedly from whatever discipline you enter in from. So thoroughly engaging, the book is erudite uh, and insightful, and it really opens up for new directions, I've felt, in understanding how humans shape the values attached to musical meaning. And throughout, there is the sense that you stay in the realm of the empirical due to the level of self-reflection you exercise, which then boosts the credibility of your own scholar persona and the passion you exude for the music you study. And that is also one of the endearing qualities of this book. So all in all, I'm just going to come clean and say, In Concert is a masterpiece, and it will be a major source for scholars of all disciplines for decades to come, and I guess long after we have gone. Um, that is my absolute uh, conviction about the book. And I thought today, as we have very uh, short time to talk about this, I would just assemble a few points to discuss that actually spring forth from my own interdisciplinary position as a popular musicologist. And I'm aware that in the interviews and the reviews of the book so far, you have already had quite a lot of feedback from scholars in the other interrelated disciplines. So, uh, you know, I felt, you know, this would be a great opportunity to come in from a musicolog musicological perspective and, um, just uh, hear your views on some of the points that come up in the book that I think might be very interesting for the people assembled with, uh, with us here today. Um, and I would like to start off by uh, saying that I felt that the concept of framing mm -hmm. was one of the dominant threads in your book. And in drawing on the work of Goffman and Bateson, you do apply this in your own unique way. And you stress that frames on matters of social consensus rather than just individual psychology. You also state that sound, to quote you, must be framed as music according to commonly held definitions of what this means in order to be heard as music, and, unquote. And perhaps most compelling in this respect is the awareness that structures of expectations ADA interpretation of experiences. And this evolves into equally invigorating um, conceptions of genre and the persona. And I know these are the other two main pillars in the book, uh, in addition to the frame. And emergent trends uh, you have detected um, are very much prevalent in contemporary pop artists, such as Billie Eilish and Lil Nas. And I know the term and concept of frame is more widespread in its use in media studies than in musicology. And you are definitely one of the first scholars to import this into popular musicology. And I just wondered whether you could say something about the applicability of frame theory as a method for analysis and how this is actually a really rich tool for musical interpretation. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for that incredibly flattering uh, introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the idea of framing, as you've sort of already said, uh, for me is closely related to the concept of genre, since genres are in effect frames that uh, create certain kinds of expectations and uh, on the part of both musicians and their audiences as to what is going to take place. 
uh, in terms of musical style, but also in terms of all of the aspects um, of performance. Um, one thing that I actually didn't get into in the book, uh, which is which is another aspect of how framing is is useful, how the concept of the frame is useful, um, is that individual moments of performances can be framed differently. Okay, so that there's sort of an overall frame, which you could call a concert or something like that, or a particular kind of concert or musical event that creates certain sorts of expectations as to what's going to be happening, what the role of performers and audiences will be with respect to one another, um, and so forth. But he, he Goffman, he doesn't go into this very much, but in a couple of different places, he points out the difference, for example, between a performer speaking to an audience and a performer singing or playing to an audience, right? And so these are moments that are framed differently within the overall frame um, of the event. So, so the reason I'm bringing this up is because, and, and you already sort of touched on this, but I wanna, I wanna emphasize it from my perspective, is that you know, what's important to me in all of this is um, a balance between sort of theory and analysis, right? In other words, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to bring into the whole discussion is the idea of performance analysis, really close looks um, at specific performances to try to understand how they work and you know what's going on in them and what relationships are established in them and what they mean and you know all that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think the concept of the frame is, is very useful in that endeavor, uh, both as a kind of starting point for just thinking about the event as a whole and, and its place in the social world, um, but then also as a means of sort of breaking down uh, the performance into different units uh, that one can look at and try to understand the many different things that are actually happening within a given performance. That was uh, really informative and um, sort of gets, I think, uh, you know, people watching this to uh, be curious in the way in which it's applied, we hope. And um, I know I, I, I would, if, if we have time a bit later, I'd love to also uh, have a little bit of a discussion on um, the way in which staging might also be an aspect of framing because uh, there are certain interchangeable concepts going on here and I'd very much like to, but I would rather leave that while, okay. you know, while we get onto other things. Um, in turn, this is always really uh, interesting for uh, people studying within sort of my subject areas uh, here in Norway. Um, and it's the, the disciplinary basis of the book. Um, and many of your approaches and thoughts really feed into this field identified as popular musicology. And indeed your work on the musical persona has paved the way forward for many of us, almost all of us, I would say, in musicology departments where there is popular music research going on and audiovisual analysis. Of course, popular music, as we know, can be studied without audiovisual analysis. And then maybe some of these issues you and I have both delved into are not so relevant for those scholars. But given that you are quite critical, as I am, of uh, conventional musicology in your writings, indeed you say explicitly in the first pages of your introduction, I am not a musicologist by training. Right. You know, it's quite confessional this. Um, but I would like to hear how, uh, hear a little bit about how you feel about your own positioning within this uh, relatively new field that has opened up within popular music studies and whether you are comfortable with being situated within popular musicology as someone who has not, again, to repeat what you said, had the training in musicology? I find this a really, really interesting question. Yeah, it is an interesting question. I mean, I, you know, my, my academic background is sort of multiplex in the sense that my undergraduate degree is actually in art history um, yeah. and my graduate degrees are in theater. Um, and, uh, but, you know, in the course of my career, I've, I've sort of entered into fields that I did not at the time have the official background to do. So, I mean, one of the, one of the other ones, uh, which comes up in the book Liveness is uh, legal studies, uh, yeah. which I've also, uh, I've also gone into a couple of times. 
uh, in my career. And, you know, and I just, I just feel like certainly it's incumbent upon me to do my homework um, and not to just sort of stumble into other people's terrain um, and, and, you know, say things that may not make any sense or, or don't really contribute to anything. So I've always tried to be very careful about, um, you know, A, doing the homework and then B, interfacing with people like yourself, um, mm -hmm. to, you know, who are in the field more officially than I am, if you like, um, and, and just to have dialogue, it's just to make sure that, you know, my participation is, has some value. Um, and, you know, so far that, that does seem to be the case. Now, I mean, I've seen myself identified as an art historian, as a musicologist, as a media studies scholar, as a performance studies scholar. And yeah, I mean, I sort of do all of these things uh, in one way or another uh, in, in various uh, combinations. Um, so uh, to answer your question directly, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty happy <laughs> to be identified with the field of popular musicology. And, you know, so far the, the feedback that I've gotten uh, from, from my participation in it has been quite positive. So I, I feel as if um, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, making some reasonable contribution. It's funny, it's a funny question though also because when the book when I was going through the editorial process, or actually very early, the kind of when I submitted possibly the proposal, one of the people on the editorial board um, raised a question about, or, or sort of was very insistent on the idea that this book needed to be situated, you know, squarely in the field of popular musicology. Um, really? And, I, and I've always sort of thought of it as yes, true. And it's certainly true that most of the work on music that I have done has been on popular mm. music. Uh, rock music to a very large extent. Um, but my idea of the, the musical persona idea, I've always thought of as something much broader that, you know, in principle is relevant to pretty much any kind, I hope anyway, I know it's a big claim, but any kind uh, of musical performance that inevitably involves a persona of some kind, some kind of construct of the performer that's appropriate to the performance uh, and musical context. Uh, so I was uh, when I didn't I didn't object to this, but I, I did make me a little bit um, I don't know antsy <laughs> just because yes. I wasn't yeah. really sure that I wanted the idea of musical persona to be locked into yeah. popular musicology. But you know, again, inevitably, since uh, most of the work I do does focus on popular music, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's fair enough. And it has to be said also that. Um, the term is relatively new and it's very controversial. Uh, you know, Alan Moore has uh, swayed quite a lot in his um, analysis of the term, in fact, you know, from uh, his book on analyzing popular music into the um, anthology on critical musicology yeah. uh, readings and so forth. So there's been all sorts of shifting sounds going on here. But uh, it has to be said that your uh, work was actually a uh, part of the very first um, anthology that was ever put together, making a case for popular oh. musicology in 2009 by Derek Scott. So, you know, you were kind of in there from the beginning. And I think um, just by your sheer contribution to the field, this has also opened up um, the minds of musicologists uh, with a traditional, albeit, um, uh, current musicological training yeah. that, you know, we have these very, very important things to consider. So, um, you know, uh, you, you are so well placed within this field, uh, if you are happy with that. Um, <laughs> of the many strings to your bow uh, in, in concert, your ideas on visualization, which I've already referred to, um, on, on the visualization of performance surfaces really profound. And again, in chapter three, you address a wealth of theories on the ideas of liveness and performance practice, where relationships between auditory and visual aspects often go against the traditional game, uh, grain. Could you say something um, about your findings when analyzing Jefferson Airplay Plane with reference to the spectacular aspects of performance in the form of the light show, because I haven't come across anyone else that has actually gone into this kind of detail. And it must be incredible fun doing this. <laughs> yes, uh, and actually, and actually doing some research into the history of the light show, which other people in, in other fields, actually more in, in uh, moving image studies, 
Um, there are a few people who've kind of ventured into this. Um, and, but it was, it was really interesting to find out more about, you know, where the, where the light shows came from. Uh, and then in, in terms, particularly in terms of their use by Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of paradox there. And, th and this actually goes back to uh, some work I did for the Glam Rock book. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of discussion in uh, people or you know, material about rock in the 1960s that describes it as theatrical or Dionysian or, you know, things like that. And yet when I look at the performances, to my eye, they are not, certainly not Dionysian. And, and I mean, maybe they give rise to a Dionysian affect on the part of the audience. I don't know. But just looking at the performances themselves. They are far from Dionysian. And, and secondly, they aren't even all that theatrical. I mean, in mm -hmm. fact, I think that, it, especially in the United States, less so in the UK, uh, psychedelic rock, you know, tended to be, the performers tended to be sort of anti-theatrical. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they would, you know, often turn their backs to the audience. As I said in the chapter, they would perform with the lights off you know, <laughs> so that they couldn't be seen at all. Um, they would, you know, often, if you watch, especially Jefferson Airplane, especially Yorma Kalkin, and when he's playing guitar, he's mostly looking down at his hands, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and even more so, they, they did talk to the audience, they did address the audience, certainly, uh, but they didn't seem to have, to have a whole lot of concern about the audience or the mm -hmm. presence of the audience. Um, so in that sense, to me, they're relatively, on sort of on the scale of things, relatively anti-theatrical. But then there is this spectacular element of the light show that's brought in, right? Almost as a as a kind of compensation, in a sense, for the lack of theatricality on the actual part of the of the of the performers. This is very clear also in the UK side with with Pink Floyd in the 1960s, yeah. where they were essentially hiding behind their light show. Um, so it's an interesting it's an interesting sort of paradox that the overall event is highly theatrical, but mostly because of the element that's brought into it to enhance the performer's uh, presence, which by and large is relatively low key um, and, uh, you know, not especially uh, theatrical. Um, and that, I think, you know, sort of speaks to one of the themes of that chapter, which is the, you know, how, how large a role the kind of visual dimension of the performance can play in creating the performance or establishing the nature of the performance. Um, so that people come away from psychedelic rock concerts feeling as if they had a highly theatrical experience, but then that's largely due to, you know, the light show and, and this kind of additional visual uh, aspect of the performance that goes well beyond what the performers are, themselves are doing, um, at least in that case. And then the other thing that I thought was interesting um, in, that, in that chapter was the, um, just the idea of, of the way the light show becomes a kind of signifier. Um, and so you have someone like uh, Virgil Fox, uh, the, you know, the organist who wanted to court a young audience or, or wanted to do concerts uh, of Bach that were more like rock shows than they were like classical recitals. Um, and so, you know, he started to perform with a light show uh, and that, that becomes a kind of signifier of, of, of his attempt to place his performances into a specific kind of cultural context, even when he wasn't performing for rock audiences, which he did, but he also, you know, would bring the light shows into other contexts, but always to create that suggestion that, you know, he was uh, shifting uh, the context of the, of the performance of Bach um, into a more kind of countercultural setting. And the detail with with which you go into this is really important for scholars in that lighting is something that is very neglected in um, audiovisual work and even in film studies I've felt uh, for, mm. for many years. And I think uh, the synesthetic uh, aspects of sort of color and sound become really, really prevalent in, you know, discussing psychedelic um, effects and so forth. And this is a much needed part, again, of research into those visual components, which are often sidestepped, uh, sidestepped yeah. um, because we are so concentrating on the, uh, on the actual uh, artist and, you know, the staging of that in terms of choreography and everything else going on. But without lighting, you know, we would be lost. Yeah. 
That's true. <laughs> by, by the light. Yeah, the, the, while you were speaking, you know, the, the, this image came into my head of, I don't know if I, if I ever wrote, wrote this or included it, but, you know, there's a little bit of stuff in one of the chapters about Keith Jarrett. And, um, but the, one of the sh shots in, in, from, from a documentary of one of his solo performances that actually stays in my head is from, I think it's either, it's either from the very beginning of the concert or from before the encore, when all you see is a piano on stage spotlit, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's a compelling image and it's a very important part of the performance. Um, but it's the sort of thing, as you say, that people don't tend to, to think about um, in terms of its, of its significance uh, uh, to the performance as an event. Yeah. And just talking about objects like a piano on stage, um, uh, getting to um, a favorite uh, conversation you, have, you and I have had before, uh, 4 minutes 33. Yeah. Um, I, I can't remember, did Cage actually stipulate that the pianist be on stage at the beginning or yeah. does he, oh, he or she can't. walk onto the stage? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, actually, I've been doing some more research into that piece and there are three different scores for it. And the first score is just a regular, I mean, it's blank, but it's a regular uh, mm -hmm. you know, piece of manuscript, which doesn't say anything about the performer or what the performer is supposed to do. It's just a, a you know, piece to be performed like any other. The time signature is 4-4, by the way, <laughs> in, case, in case you didn't know that. Um, and but, yet the audience, is, the audience has not told us 4 No, four, no. no. Right? Um, but uh, David Tudor, the, the pianist who, you know, of course, was the first one to perform that piece, mm -hmm. uh, did go on record as to say that not only from his point of view, uh, many people have performed it and performed it in many ways, obviously, but from his point of view, not only was it important that the performer or the pianist be present, but that the pianist actually follow the music and turn the pages um, <laughs> as, as the time went on. Uh, that right. this was a crucial part um, mm -hmm. of performing this. Now, there are the, there are the two other scores. The, the third one is a, a purely verbal score, which is probably the best known one, where he just mm -hmm. describes. And by that point, he, it doesn't even have to be a, a piano anymore. It can be any mm -hmm. combination of instruments for any durations. So it's no longer necessarily four minutes and 33 seconds, and it's no longer necessarily a piano piece. Um, right. but, uh, uh, but the earlier version definitely was, and although I don't know that Cage specifically said that, the, you know, about said anything about uh, the presence of the performer, uh, David Tudor mm -hmm. clearly did have very specific ideas um, about how it, uh, yes. uh, how it should be performed. And I would That's, guess the, the audiovisual component of that performance is relatively. Yeah, important. exactly. I mean, that's, and that's to me what really is really interesting about it, that mm -hmm. there's a kind of real, I think it's more than a paradox. I think it's almost self-defeating um, in the sense that, you know, on the one hand, Cage seems to have wanted um, the performer to really just be a kind of framing device. That, and mm -hmm. this goes back to what you were saying at the very beginning, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, a framing device that would encourage the audience to hear whatever sound there was as music, to frame it mm -hmm. as music, not just as something to listen to, but specifically to listen to the way you would listen to music, right? Um, and so that's why it's important to have a musician there and an instrument um, and yes. so on. But at the same time, Cage ultimately also said that, you know, since the purpose of the piece really is to direct your attention, um, you don't need a performer at all. All you need is, is the ability to direct your attention. Um, yes. And later on, he said, you know, I do this all the time. I don't, you know, I don't need to have the performer there. So there's a way in which, on the one hand, the performer of that piece is supposed to be completely self-effacing, right? It's just there to provide a framing. Um, but in reality, when you actually watch performances of the piece, since there is no sound, it becomes all about what you're looking at. And I think, you know, I think that's, I think David Tudor was sort of acknowledging that by saying, you know, you don't just sit there, you sit there, you follow the music, you turn the pages, you behave the way uh, a musician would behave. And that gives the audience something to watch, in fact. Mm. Um, and so I think the, even though the visual dimension, the presence of the performance on that piece is supposed to be in a way irrelevant um, it actually turns out to be what, or at least from my perspective, it turns out to be entirely what the piece is about, right? It becomes yes. entirely about the, convention, the visual conventions of performance 
um, and, and many other things depending on how it's performed. So it's, it's a really interesting case in point. And of course, the um, enriching aspect of this is that every performance is so diff different yeah, yeah. in that uh, there's never ever going to be exactly the same staging when it comes to lighting and color and all these other elements within the performance. Yeah, and I've been, I've been watching a lot of performances of it. <laughs> and, and one of the things that's really interesting is um, sort of the question of how I put this, whether or not the performer lays hands on the instrument. Right. So I don't think David Tudor or most pianists who perform it actually put their hands on the keys. Um, but I've seen performances like this one, I can't identify it right now, but this one uh, with an ensemble where, um, for example, a trombonist actually stands up at a certain point as if you were doing a solo or something, and then just kind of stands there with the trombone, you know. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, little different from yeah, uh, from exactly. just having a piano and a pianist but the pian mm. pianist not actually you know touching the keys um, mm. sort of more like you know he looks like he's actually playing something or gonna play something <laughs> so it's it's uh, uh yeah it's, there's a, uh, it's a fascinating possibilities there. <laughs> yeah. it's a fascinating example to actually yeah. use in teaching as well um and i guess um john cage uh thought enormously uh, during his uh, life as a composer about vocal persona. And um, in your work, you turn to Cohn and Gelbart's work when discussing the vocal persona with attention yeah. to B.B. King's persona when he sings, suggesting his guitar functions as an alter ego. I love that moment in the, in the book because that also, again, in in your characteristic uh, theoretical style, um, impinges on discourses within psychology, but you don't leave it there. You actually extend this and you bring in a wealth of other aspects to your um, interpretation. Now, I was particularly drawn to your ideas on the ventriloquial uh, paradigm of instrumental performances and gain much from your reading of Mari Kimura's Guitar Botana from 2004. And I'm sure um, our listeners again would like to hear a little bit about Guitar Bot's performance, which you actually read as a displacement of computer's agency, if I understood that correctly. <laughs> and that was a, a really, really big surprise in the book, you know, landing on uh, what is a relatively unknown artist for many of us working yeah. within uh, popular music studies, you know. Yeah, Mari. Could you just Mari, say a few things about that. I will try. Mari Kimura is a uh, classical violinist with a very strong experimental. With bent. a very strong experimental. Mm -hmm. bent. Performs, you know, conventionally, but she, she also does a lot of stuff with um, experimental uh, instrumental techniques and then also electronics. Um, the ex experimental instrumental technique she's most interested in is subharmonics. Uh, you know, producing tones lower yeah. than the instrument's register. Um, but she's also done a lot with uh, motion gloves and, you know, robots and whatever. So guitar bot is a, is a robotic musical instrument um, that's controlled by a computer um, using MIDI. And uh, so she wrote a piece for it, uh, which she's also performed that, that it's written in a way that uh, there, are, there are spots left in the score where uh, guitar bot has been programmed to, so to say, improvise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to, to produce uh, on, she, in other words, she doesn't know exactly what it's going to do during those spots. Um, but apart from that, it's a sort of duet between her playing the violin um, and the uh, a robotic instrument. And what I was really interested in that chapter was just trying to think through the relationship of performer or of instrumentalist and instrument in terms of questions of agency. And I thought that B.B. King and Mari Kumura were two very interesting examples because in different ways, they both indeed displace their agency onto other things. So B.B. King and his claim that his guitar Lucille is a separate person from him um, is you know, displacing his agency as guitarist onto the instrument itself. Um, and Mari Kimura, it's a little more elaborate because there's a computer involved. So therefore she doesn't actually touch guitar bot. 
it seems to perform autonomously. Right. Um, so it's one step away from B.B. King, right, who's still touching <laughs> the guitar yeah. while at the same time claiming that it's its own mm -hmm. its own being. Um, she's she's a little bit better able to make that claim since the instrument is you know on the other side of the stage from her, but is mm -hmm. nevertheless actually being controlled by her uh, mm -hmm. through her playing to which it responds, and then also through her programming of it. Um, mm -hmm. So so I thought these were these I was just trying to. I was trying to find a way of kind of getting to this sort of question of yeah. agency and that relationship between uh, performer and instrument and these two somewhat eccentric cases I thought were, uh, mm. were kind of good ways of opening up that, uh, that question. Um, and as I say, the book is, the book is very rich with um, sort of an incredible array of uh, genres and styles and idioms. And what I loved about it was that you would suddenly bring in people that obviously you knew not all of us would be aware of. And uh, this is also part of the really important dismantling of uh, the, ge the generic uh, label of popular music. You know, uh, we, we have to constantly be aware that this shouldn't be too constrained in, um, by definition. And you really prove this in this book, you know? Well, I think that's one of the advantages of looking at things in terms of performance i mean all music yes. is performed and if that's kind of the the point of entry which it definitely is for me then you're really you know uh, anything is fair game in a sense right yeah. um and 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 as i said before because i do want the concept the basic concept of, of musical persona to cut across genres um I, I i at least tried you know here and there to bring in examples from, well, well, that, as you say, might appear to be outside what one normally yes. thinks of as, as popular yeah. music. Uh, but and by doing that, that, it gets us to think about what is inside and what is in, uh, outside and so forth. And these are the um, really important aspects of the book. Um, however, you do land in chapter 10 on um, the most commercial pop music um, <laughs> we can actually find in society. and. Um, the title Barbie in a Meat Dress and uh, performance and mediatization in the 21st century is really a visionary um, chapter in that it gets us to really start looking forward and wondering what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I got a lot out of this um, chapter for pretty obvious reasons to you. Um, and when it, when it comes to commercial pop music, um, and the music industry, obviously we cannot avoid the rapacity of ambitions and strategies of the super icons and personae of the pop world and how these are continuously cunningly packaged. This is always, you know, part of the discourse, even though uh, if you take my work, I don't necessarily go into critical discussion about the right. music industry, but I'm always aware of what I've just described as um, the rapacity of ambitions by the music industry and pop stars. And as your book comes to an end, you do discuss these uh, two artists who I've also dwelt a lot on, Lady Gaga and Nicki Minaj. And your last, and this last chapter in your book, which actually comes under the section three, which is called Context of Performance, addresses the uh, usage of personae as a way of navigating mediatized culture and what you describe as the indirect mediatization of performance. Um, Minaj's identification with Barbie is, as you point out so well, no doubt very political and provocative, not least with respect to race and gender. Yeah. And as you argue, for a Black Caribbean American female to embrace Barbie as one of the characters she portrays is problematic and opens up for a critical discourse. And your framing of her strategies of subversion and her knowingness about parody is really vital here. And uh, the way in which you sort of highlight her skills in impersonating um, highly stylized and fictional characters is 
actually what allows her access to many strategies. So this results in a definition of the menage persona, uh, which I know people who read this book are going to gain a lot from because it is actually a liberating force when embodying characters that are different in sexuality, national, nationality, race, and so on. Um, I've been really wanting to ask you this question uh, since I first met you, and we just haven't had the chance, but could you elaborate on your perception of postmodern culture as mediatized culture in 1989, which I know was a very, very important landmark in your work, and how it still holds valid in your interpretation of artists now in the second decade of the 21st century, especially with regard to sort of all the new technologies we have, such as multi-selfing. This was yeah. <laughs> an incredibly interesting uh, and compelling idea that deals with sort of morphing and switching among identities. And maybe could just, we, we could conclude this uh, short conversation we've had just to hear a little bit what you feel about where we are today and how this all feeds in to the role of performance and media in this really traumatic age of COVID-19. Mm. Well, that's a whole, that last part is a, that's a whole separate discussion unto itself. Um, yeah. The, I mean, just to uh, encapsulate it, I would say that my, my overall perception of uh, postmodern culture as mediatized or mediatized culture uh, from, yeah, 1989 to the present, Really, I, I don't think I see qualitative change as much as quantitative change, um, mm -hmm. and particularly with res quantitative with respect to velocity, the speed at which things happen, uh, which I think is ever increasing. Um, but for me, the the idea of mediatized culture, well, that first came up, of course, in my book, Liveness, uh, yeah. Performance in a Mediatized Culture. That was the first time I, I engaged with that concept. and. What, of course, in that, in that instance, what I was really interested in was sort of what happens to or what is the status of live performance in a culture in which media and mediatized versions of things seem to have so much more uh, cultural and social purchase than the live events, or at least that's how I was feeling about it when I first you know, sort of ventured out into, uh, into that project. Um, and I think that remains true. I mean, obviously, things have changed a lot and particularly changed a lot in the music industry where until COVID, uh, live performance had kind of regained a very important economic status because of the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the dropping in value of recorded music. Um, so live performance once again became uh, significant, at least from an economic standpoint, but still in competition with all of these other you know, its own recorded forms and, 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 you know, social media and all of these new platforms um, across which things are, are distributed and disseminated. Um, and I think, you know, artists like uh, Nicki Minaj and especially Lady Gaga are extremely savvy uh, as to how to make use of, of that whole landscape um, of media, social media, uh, et cetera, and all of the different forms that, that it takes on. Um, so to me, th there's been over the last 25 years, whatever it's been, um, you know, a kind of acceleration of this. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily, in, you know, uh, intrinsically that different from, from what was happening then, but, uh, you know, over time, more and more things, I mean, certainly in 1989, social media, I don't think social media existed. Um, so, uh, so I was just thinking more about, you know, television and the internet, you know, I think to some extent and things like that as, uh, as the platforms, um, on which, uh, through which, uh, all of these things were being disseminated. Uh, and so now we just have so many more platforms. Um, and, and yeah, I do see in the way in which these artists uh, negotiate that and switch and morph and transform themselves across different platforms and from moment to moment and so on um, as, any, as uh, a kind of reflection of what we all have to do, that multi-selfing thing that you mentioned. Yes. Uh, which again is just an acceleration of something Irving Goffman was talking about in 1959, right? Mm -hmm. Presentation yeah. of self. You're different and each of your, your presentations of self is different according right. to the audience mm -hmm. you're engaging with. But now it's just, you know, so much happening so much faster, so much more, uh, you know, 
Um, I actually, the term multi-selfing, uh, I, I coined it and then I went to look for it to see if anyone else had used it. And I did find a source for it. So that made right. it legitimate. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I like, uh, I like the, that, uh, that sort of concept as a way of describing uh, you know, just have all the different self presentations we have to engage in, um, and and the rapidity with which we have to switch from one to another, which I actually think has become you know perhaps even greater uh, in the age of COVID, since you know yes. we're, we're continually online, offline, zooming, you know, uh, yes. talking to people, et cetera. So it's I think probably we're multi selfing at a faster rate than even uh, a little bit before that, um, but. And the other thing about Lady Gaga in particular that really struck me um, in terms of her strategies is, and this, I, I suppose this has changed somewhat uh, over time, but was the, the sort of almost invisibility of her, of her um, in the sense that, especially in her earlier days, you know, every time you see her, she looked different. Um, and to the point of, of being almost unrecognizable or actually unrecognizable from moment to moment. Uh, and even to this day, I mean, one of the things that I think is if you want to just talk crassly in terms of, of the business, uh, one of the things I think is still really interesting about Lady Gaga is that she does have connections. Uh, you know, she works with various corporate entities, she promotes various products, but you never ever see an endorsement by Lady Gaga and you never ever see her face attached to any product. Interesting. Uh, even though she is actually um, uh, you know, working with various corporations to help promote uh, various products. I mean, they, they do show up as product placements in her music videos, um, but there's never any kind of direct endorsement on her part, uh, as you know, in, in, pre in previous times, there most definitely would have been. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very interesting uh, and very different strategy uh, of branding that I think is, is, uh, is interesting and worth keeping, you know, sort of keeping an eye on uh, because yeah. it may have something to do with, uh, you know, where we're headed. And I think, uh, you know, having this debate in the last chapter um, of the book also brings in this uh, idea of the multi-platforms, which we are all facing now when it comes to the question of what's in concert. And um, I think, you know, ending on that note was um, actually quite brilliant in sort of getting the reader to sort of look forward, uh, not necessarily in a positive way, but just to look forward into the future. Um, and uh, it was a wonderful conclusion to the book. And um, I'm just going to finish off by saying in so many ways, uh, Phil, this uh, book is a remarkable achievement and uh, it's a major addition without any doubt to music studies into not only performers but also performances mm -hmm. and um, its subject matter is eloquently expressed and demonstrates that um, I think once we understand that a particular event has been framed as a performance of music, we then have a better chance of knowing the terms by which to interpret the situation. And this is kind of the overriding message I got out of the book. And in music performance, to quote you, we know that those terms are different from the ones that would enable us to understand and interpret another kind of situation, such as the performance of a play. Right. And you make that point very strong. So, um, as I said from the beginning, I have loads and loads of uh, comments and feelings about the book. And, um, you know, I really want to wish you all the success with uh, the reception of it. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that in concert is going to be a beacon of light in music research for decades to come. So, a very big congratulations to you. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I certainly hope you're right. <laughs> Great. Thank nice you. Nice talking with you. Thanks, Phil. Bye.
Well, great. Um, so now, unless Phil has anything else he wants to add in before we move to Q&A. Phil, do you? Um, that was me at the end. They're looking for the off button, I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's just one, one quick little thing that I would like to say, which is uh, about the title of the book, uh, In Concert, which is uh, meant to refer to two things. I mean, one is certainly the idea of taking the concert as a sort of basic unit of musical performance, if you like, or the kind of event that I uh, was primary, primarily the sort of default event that I was thinking about. Uh, but it also refers to the idea of the audience and the performers working together in concert to make the event happen, mm -hmm. right? which is another actually important theme of the book, um, uh, having to do with the interaction between those two groups. So yeah, apart from that, I am happy to move to Q and A. Okay, um, we have a few questions in the chat, but um, but I just want to encourage anybody who's got something on their mind to um, to put their hand up in there and put their name in because um, we'll get through these questions. Um, but um, Eric, did you want to actually ask your question about Apple and light shows um, here? Or was it more of a comment? Oh, well, I was trying to half remember, but wasn't Stuart Brand who becomes such a central figure in an internet culture, part of the light show culture of the West Coast in the counterculture? Um, that was my understanding from that book from counterculture to cyberculture. That that's where he sort of got his start was doing light shows. Um, and I was wondering if in a way, one of the things that's been happening around music to take the 60s as your start frame, not the postmodern 80s as your start frame, is a kind of wrapping of things around music that hadn't been wrapped around it before. Um, so if in one era it's a light show in another era, it would be an internet platform. Um, and if that's part of what the in concert experience has been about the kind of multiplicity of things encompassing the live experience. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting point. I don't, I, I have to give that, I have to give that some thought to really say anything <laughs> uh, intelligent about it. But, uh, and also I, I would be interested in maybe try to think that idea back earlier mm. um, uh, as to what form that might have taken, you know, in the 50s or even in the 40s. Um, but yeah, no, I, that's, that's a really interesting thought. I'm, I'm gonna need to give that some, uh, some sure. more consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll ask Joe Mabel to um, pose the question that Philip already sort of <laughs> answered in the <laughs> chat, um, but just so for those who haven't had a chance to um, read, read in there, hear it. We can go to it live. Regional differences, particular places that stood out for how they did it, you know, influences from one place onto another in terms of the evolution of the light show. And I know Phil, you already answered it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't have a, a like really fine grained answer to that. I mean, I really wish I could say, oh, well, in Boston it was this, in Minneapolis it was that, you know. But, but there are definitely some kind of large scale differences, which I, which I sort of noted in the chat. I mean, um, th and there's, there is a, there's a, a, a sort of story, which I recount in the book about how the East Coast light shows came to be. Um, I'm not gonna go on and on about it, but um, it basically had to do with uh, a meeting in Canada, sort of between, you know, you West Coast here, East Coast here, San Francisco, New York, and then up here, Toronto, <laughs> well, up here, Toronto, um, and uh, which was uh, a meeting that was, was kind of brokered by uh, Bill Graham uh, when there was a, uh, supposed to be, I guess there was a, a kind of San Francisco psychedelic rock concert at Massey Hall um, in Toronto. And the idea was to, it was, a, it was a technical problem of how do you do in a, a light show such as they were doing uh, on the West Coast, which as I said in, in the chat, was basically immersive. In other words, the lights were projected onto the performers and the audience and really suffused the whole space, especially in the earliest days of this. Um, but the Fillmore East uh, was of a converted movie theater, which actually had a proscenium. 
right? So it was a very different kind of space. And the question is, how do you do light shows in that sort of space, right? And so uh, at this at this concert in, in Toronto, this event in Toronto, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but one of the chief San Francisco light show artists, one of the originators of it, um, met with Joshua White of the Joshua White light show. Um, and um, between the two of them, well, I don't think they liked each other very much, but between the two of them, they sort of figure out how do you adapt that kind of effect to a proscenium screen. And so as I, or proscenium stage. So as I said in the chat, um, you know, if you look, I mean, I'm speaking very broadly because there are always going to be exceptions, but if you look at uh, the, the light, the East Coast light shows, um, you'll see that they are for the most part rear projected on screens behind the performers. Whereas the West Coast light shows tended, at least in the initial stages, to be immersive where the lights were projected on everybody. And of course, therefore, in the East Coast light shows, the audiences are not part of it at all. Right? I mean, it's projected behind the performers, not even on the performers, and certainly not on the audience. So it creates a much more, in a sense, traditional, um, traditional uh, theatrical effect. But there's a, I don't know if it's still up, but there's a actually pretty wonderful, uh, in certain ways, uh, <laughs> uh, video uh, of the Jefferson Airplane performing at the Fillmore East, okay, with a really, really spectacular light show behind them. But one of the things that's funny about this video, um, it's, it's part of a, a longer, because, you know, Bill Graham filmed and recorded everything. So, uh, so there, are, there are, you know, there's archival material, all these shows. And I've watched the, the longer version of, of this particular concert. And what's really funny to me is that, you know, it sort of starts with the framing of the band and the light show is kind of behind and above them. Okay, this wonderful, spectacular changing image. And over time, the camera person slowly moves the camera up so that by the end, you're just looking at the light show, right? I mean, you no longer see the musicians. And this is because the musicians were boring to look at, which is what comes back to my, you know, my point about the anti-theatricality of, of that kind of, of performance, right? That, that ultimately, even, even the guy, person charged with filming the show, you know, just got bored looking at the musicians um, and ended up sort of drifting away from them to this much more spectacular thing um, that above them, that they, you know, it was ultimately competing with them in visual terms, right? Not obviously in sound terms, but in visual terms. Um, so that, that's, to me, that's a kind of, I don't know, dramatization of that relationship that the camera person couldn't even, you know, may remain focused on the musicians because they were so uninteresting. Okay. Um, next up, we have uh, David Shumway. Hi, Phil. Hi. Um, so my question is about the theory of theatricality and anti-theatricality and whether the art historical discussion about that had any, any influence on your treatment of it. Um, yeah, not really. I mean, I, I'm certainly very much aware of uh, Michael Fried and I have entertained his ideas in other contexts. But uh, for me, talking about these sorts of things now, uh, well, talking about these sorts of things, I'm really using a very kind of garden variety concept of theatricality. Right? I mean, sort of pretty much the common sense term. What do people mean when they talk about things as being theatrical? That's pretty much what I mean. Now that said, I don't disagree at all with <laughs> Fried's characterization of theatricality, which to you know, a certain extent has to do with a kind of dependence of, well, in his case, paintings and sculptures, in my case, performances uh, on the audience right, the, on the presence of the audience. Um, the difference is that he sees that as unhealthy in the visual arts context, and I see it simply as defining in the performance context. I mean, of course, right? Of course, there's that relationship of dependence, uh, or, or certain kinds of dependence, I should say. Um, you know, you can't have a performance without an audience, and you can't have an audience without a performance. So there's a mutual uh, defining dependence between these two things. Uh, but again, for free, looking at you know minimalist sculpture, this is a bad thing. Uh, for me, it cannot be a bad thing <laughs> um, because it's simply sort of the bedrock of uh, of what I'm talking about. So I wouldn't, I actually wouldn't quibble with Free as to how he defines theatricality. Um, what I would, uh, what I where I just you know can't uh, 
uh, follow him is into that sort of negative characterization of it. But again, it's in different contexts, right? I um, mean, he's talking about the relationship between visual art objects and you know, spectators. And I'm talking about relationships between human beings. But there is something I'd like to throw into the mix here, which is just an idea that I've had that I haven't really done much with um, about around these whole ideas of theatricality and anti-theatricality, uh, which is that if you think about some performers, I was thinking particularly about certain uh, jazz musicians, uh, although this is not, I don't mean to single that out, it can happen in any context, uh, but certain uh, instances of performers who are so anti-theatrical that it eventually starts to come across almost as a kind of, well, either willful ignoring of the audience or actually a kind of antagonistic ignoring of the audience, right? Um, and so it's really interesting to me how, you know, anti-theatricality can become so histrionic in itself that it becomes theatrical again, right? Um, and that's what I see in, in some of those performers who makes, you know, such a thing of, <laughs> Of, uh, of their disdain or disregard for the audience and catering to it in any way, including performing in an exciting manner, right? Um, but, but the more, so to say, exaggerated that behavior becomes, then the more theatrical it becomes. So there's this curious, I don't know, Mobius strip of theatricality and anti-theatricality where the one is continually or at least potentially turning into the other. Um, this next question feels like it might come pretty naturally out of that one, which is from Matthew Bannister. Oh, hi, Phil. Um, my question was about performing in glam rock. Um, I'm interested in how some glam rock performers had a very active relationship with their live audience, for example, say Slade, and whether the focus on in your book on glam musical persona is kind of other tended to downplay this relation. Or another way of putting this would be to say. Whoops, what happened to him? Sorry, another. Uh, uh, sorry, another way of, yeah, nerves. <laughs> another way of putting this would be uh, this question would be doesn't the glam anthem or the glam anthem presume an audience participating? Um, yeah, I don't have any problem <laughs> with that proposition. But um, yeah, that's interesting. So you're, you're referring specifically to sort of, we said glam anthems, is that, that's the? Well, that was the, I saw two examples. The first as a band that had a very uh, kind of sort of almost proletarian kind of image and were kind of known for their very rowdy and interactive performances. Yeah. Yeah. How that kind of, in any ways, contrasts with the kind of sort of uh, David Bowie type persona of a kind of, other or otherworldly kind of persona and that one sort of presumes a much more or presumes a more active relationship with the audience and whether that's kind oh, of okay point. okay yeah I well okay so first of all I will I will confess that um, the whole sort of question of performer audience dynamic and glam rock is not something I got into a whole lot in the book um, um, uh, but um, I think I have probably two responses to that. One would be that I don't necessarily think that, for example, David Bowie um, was less engaged with his audience than Slade. I think they were engaged differently. Okay. And I also will confess that, and I do say this in the book, that I have a certain resistance, to, and I'm not accusing you of this by any means, um, but, but in uh, the way people talk about glam rock, there's often a very strong desire to kind of divide glam rock into two parts. Um, and the one is the more pop oriented, maybe proletarian, as you just said, uh, sort of side. And then the other is the arty side. Well, and the, you know, on the arty side, we get Bowie, we get you know, uh, early Roxy music um, and so on. And I resist that division, okay, because, uh, you know, first of all, these people are all competing for essentially the same audience um, and trying to sell records to the same people. So I'm not sure that, that that sort of, you know, art versus pop or whatever it is distinction um, uh, holds up uh, in that context. In any case, uh, it, it is one that I, I kind of argued against um, in the book. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, we're just thinking of images of Bowie performing and certainly, yeah, it's true. He didn't have that same kind of, you know, well, okay, so it's sort of interesting. Um, I was recently reading a piece by uh, Barbara Bradby about uh, the interaction between popular musicians and their audiences. And I don't wanna oversimplify her, her piece, which is very complex, but at the heart of it is a basic question about whether these interactions are conversational or ritual. Um, and on her side, ritual means more sort of uh, set, more scripted, whereas conversation is by definition more open-ended. So maybe that's a distinction that comes in here that, you know, in a sense, Slade would be more conversational, right? That would be a better way of describing their relationship to their audience. And Bowie would be more ritual um, and in, in the sense of scripted and more theatrical. Um, so that, that would be a way of sorting it out that, that, that I, that would make some, make, make a kind of sense to me, I think. I don't know if I even answered your question, but <laughs> I hope I did. Oh uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, that was great. Um, next up we have Ravi Krishnaswamy, the question. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the talk. Um, it's, it's kind of a vague question, but I'm just wondering if you've, what kind of, um, where where you think about tribute bands and how you theorize tribute bands and if they appear in your new book. Um, I play in a Smith's tribute band in New York and and I've done a little bit of writing on it um, as well um, recently, but I, I think there's a lot of really weird stuff going on there and I'm wondering, I, I'd love to just hear you riff yeah. on that. Well, I, I have actually written, it hasn't been published yet, I've written just a little bit about tribute bands, which is going to be in the third edition of my book, Liveness. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm fascinated, <laughs> I'm fascinated by the phenomena. Um, certainly if you're thinking about it in terms of musical persona, then I think the, you know, that's the whole, I mean, I know that there are different versions of tribute bands. Um, isn't there also, aren't there like different categories there? Are, I can't remember what there are, but there's, there's a couple of different terms, right? Um, but obviously those groups that, you know, not only play the music, but dress up as the artists and so on and try to replicate their onstage behavior, that's all about persona, right? I mean, it's all about the replication of, of persona as a central part of what's happening in the performance. Uh, so in that sense, it's, you know, it's very germane uh, to what I'm talking about in this book, even if I don't get into the tribute bands uh, uh, phenomenon specifically. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's that's probably my uh, in in this context, that's probably my my primary um, my primary uh, point of entry to it. But um, I also I'll just say a couple of other random things. The first is that I do believe that uh, rock bands that last long enough become their own tribute bands. Right. So right now the Rolling Stones are the best <laughs> Rolling Stones <laughs> tribute. Uh, the the uh, uh, for whatever reason, I first thought of this when I was listening to the recording of uh, the Cream revival, right? There's that live album of, of Cream who got back together and, and performed in London and New York. I think the album was recorded at Albert Hall or something. I was listening to it and going, yeah, this is a good Cream tribute band. <laughs> um, so, so that's one thing. Um, and then there are also are these kind of weird, I don't know if this is what you were talking about, strange things, but these kind of weird liminal phenomena like for example i'm not a huge prog rock fan but i do like the dutch group focus and at a certain point focus was or i think is actually the main or one of the two main but the remaining main guy from the original band and a focus tribute band that he hired to be focus right um so that's the sort of weird you know what, what, are, we, what are we talking about at that point Right? I mean, it makes total sense because obviously they could play the repertoire brilliantly, right? Um, but it's still, there's just something kind of weird and uncanny about that. And then the other event, example for me, of course, is the 20th century schizoid band, uh, which is made up almost entirely of former members of King Crimson playing King Crimson music. How is this not King Crimson, right? Um, and yet it's somehow not. It's a King Crimson tribute band. So I don't know. It's 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 a... Uh, so there are all these different kind of gradations of people who, you know, well, I guess sort of on one extreme end, the 20th century schizoid band, 
all of whom or all but one of whom were at one time actually members of the band, right? Uh, so I don't even know if that is a tribute band or what it is. And then all the way on the other side of the scale, people, you know, who have no particular, uh, have never been members of the band, but, you know, are, are, are simply playing the music. And then the differences between those who are focused primarily on playing the music uh, as against those who are also trying to replicate the, the performance, the staging, the persona uh, of, of the people. One of my favorite, I, I, I don't remember the name of the band, but one of my favorite versions of that is, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm having difficulty tonight remembering people's names. Um, so what was the name, the guy in the Rolling Stones who, who died? Uh, Brian? What was his last name? Jones. Brian Jones, yeah. Jones, thank you. All right, so there is a Rolling Stones tribute band that has Brian Jones in it. And as they're playing through uh, the material, you know, I guess they do it more or less chronologically, and they get to the point at which he died, and the musician doesn't leave at that point, but rather he remains on stage dressed as an angel with a halo and wings and so on, uh, but continues to contribute to <laughs> Um, uh, to playing the music. And I will conclude with my favorite name for a tribute band, which is the ABBA tribute band, Bjorn Again. Doesn't get better than that. I think we're going to have to call it quits there. Um, let people go have dinner and that kind of thing. Um, but I really want to thank Philip for being with us and remind everybody that the book is called In Concert. So get your hands on that already out since January. And